In the last lecture, I introduced you guys to solids and the different structures of solids. I also mentioned the fact that both of my parents were born and raised in Wyoming, and that one way I could tell that we'd actually arrived in Wyoming is if everything appeared to be a barren wasteland in all directions. Now, that's not to say all of Wyoming is like that, just all of the parts of Wyoming where my relatives lived, apparently. One thing I have to tell you about people from Wyoming is that, generally speaking, all of the people with whom I've crossed paths in Wyoming are tough as nails. My mom, I swear, she's almost 80 years old, and I swear she could wrestle a bear and make it cry like a baby. My dad was also super tough. Although cancer killed him when I was in high school, I've never seen anyone endure cancer with quite the resolve and level of toughness that he did. That said, another hallmark of arriving in Wyoming that I frequently notice, at least the regions of Wyoming where my family live, was the smell of sulfur, because there happened to be a lot of sulfur mines in that part of Wyoming, or those parts of Wyoming, and I therefore stereotypically assume that all of Wyoming smells like sulfur. That's probably not true, but just so you know, Sulfur smells like diarrhea. So when I was a kid riding with my parents in the car on my way to vacation, another way I could tell we had arrived is if the air smelled like diarrhea. Let's now continue our discussion by talking about unit cells. If you could zoom in to examine a crystalline solid closely enough, you would actually see that the entire solid is comprised of a small repeating unit called a unit cell stacked over and over three-dimensionally in all directions. And thus, the structure of a crystalline solid can be defined by A, the size and shape of its unit cell, and B, the locations of its atoms within that unit cell. So what is a unit cell? Well, here's the unit cell of sodium chloride. It looks like this. So once again, if you could zoom in on sodium chloride closely enough, you would see repeating units of individual sodium cations that are shown here in purple, and I doubt they're actually purple in real life, and chloride anions shown here in green. Once again, I doubt they're actually green in real life. But this one cubic structure is repeated again and again and again in all directions all throughout the solid sodium chloride. That's called its unit cell. So if you look closely enough at sodium chloride, you would see this unit cell repeated over and over throughout. Now, there are different kinds of unit cell structures which vary depending on the size and bond distances of the individual atoms in the solid. I do not want you, my students who take this course from me, to memorize any of these. I'm only showing you a few of them for the sake of interest. Here are some generic unit cells for metallic compounds. For example, if you had eight individual metal nuclei existing throughout a solid in this repeating cubic unit, you would call that unit cell a primitive cubic metal. If, however, you had this repeating unit that is exactly the same except it has a central metal atom right in the middle of those eight, you call that a body-centered cubic metal. And the slightly more exotic unit cell is called a face-centered cubic metal. If you'd like to, you can pause the video now and look closely at each of these to compare the similarities and differences between them. Here are some generic unit cells for simple ionic compounds. We've already seen that for sodium chloride, which looks actually a little bit more complicated than the one shown here to the left, which is cesium chloride. Cesium chloride's individual unit cell looks much like the body-centered cubic unit cell that we see in some metals. Zinc chloride structure is a little bit more exotic and shown here. Now I want to teach you about lattice structures. Now chemists name unit cell structures by the geometrical arrangements of their individual nuclei. If we treat each nucleus as a point in a three-dimensional shape, then all unit cells can be categorized by one of the following structures. As we've seen before, if each of the nuclei form a repeating cube where all of the distances between the nuclei are equal inside that box and all of the angles are 90 degrees, we call that unit cell a cubic unit cell. If, however, one of the sides is longer than the other two, it's tetragonal. If none of the three sides are equal, then it's orthorhombic. Things get a little bit more exotic if you have angles that are not 90 degrees, as indicated by these types of unit cells down here. These are called crystal lattice or lattice structures. Now to determine a compound's lattice structure, what you need to do is match your unit cell by angle and relative dimensions to the corresponding structure from the figure that I just showed you. For instance, in this problem, it tells us that the unit cell of nickel arsenide is shown right here. What type of lattice does this crystal possess? I'm not going to answer this question for you here, but we'll post a link to a separate video that you can watch, if you want to, in which I do. Now we move on to another subject. You see, you can actually determine a compound's empirical formula from its unit cell. All you have to do is add up the total number of atoms that are inside the unit cell. 
Here's a trick though. When you do this, you can only add up the number of atoms that are inside the cell, and I put three exclamation points there intentionally. This means that if an atom is straddling one of the edges or is it one of the vertices, then you don't count the entire atom because the entire atom is not inside that cube. You only count whatever fraction of the atom is actually inside the cell. So atoms at vertices only count as one-eighth of an atom. Atoms along edges only count as one-fourth, and atoms straddling a face only count as one-half. If you have an entire atom that is contained inside the unit cell rhombus, then you do count it as one full atom. For example, if we look at three different types of simple unit cells, we can see that some of the atoms, for example, these ones at the vertices along the edges or those straddling the faces of the cubes, are not completely inside the cubes. This is shown a little bit more clearly in the following figures from our book. In this case, we've taken a primitive cubic unit cell and shaved off or cut off all of the sections of each of those spheres that are not inside the cube. As you look at that, you'll notice that because each of these spheres is at a vertex, a corner inside that box, only one eighth of each sphere is actually inside the box. Therefore, you only use one eighth of each one of those atoms when integrating it into your empirical formula. Here's an analogous picture of a body-centered cubic unit cell. You can see once again that the spheres at the corners only have one eighth of them inside the box. This central atom, however, is contained completely in the box, so it would count as one entire atom. Here's an analogous approach for the face-centered cubic metal. As before, the atoms at the vertices only count as one eighth of an atom. What about the atoms that have been bisected or cut in half along each face of the cube? Yeah, because one half of each of those is inside the cube, you do count each one of those as one half. That takes us to a wonderful example question. The unit cell of a binary compound of copper and oxygen is shown here. By looking at this image, please determine the empirical formula of the compound. Now, I'm not going to show you the answer here, but I will post a link to a separate video in which I do. And next, the unit cell of nickel arsenide is shown here. Once again, using the same approach we've just delineated, Please tell me what the empirical formula is for this nickel arsenide compound. That takes us to the conclusion of this video. I hope you'll watch my next video in which I'll teach you about polymers, sulfur, and diarrhea. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.